Thank you to the organizers for inviting us to present our work here today. My colleague Rob Maddox and I are excited to present our team's efforts to sequence SARS-CoV-2 in cases in the state of Wisconsin and our recent switch to the Midnight Sequencing Kit. As the statistics from the World Health Organization show, almost two years after the first diagnosed case, SARS-CoV-2 infection remains a worldwide problem with over a quarter of a billion confirmed cases of COVID-19 and over 5 million deaths globally as of mid-November 2021. While vaccination efforts are reducing the numbers of severe cases, the virus is still actively circulating almost everywhere with variants of concern like the Delta variant emerging the longer the pandemic goes on. Unlike previous pandemics, however, this virus is remarkably well studied. GizAid, the global initiative on sharing all influenza data, also collects data for SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing efforts. As of mid-November, over 5 million sequences were submitted to the GizAid database. These global sequencing efforts are thanks largely to the Arctic and ONT teams for rapidly developing a protocol deployable on such an easily accessible sequencing device. This map shows the breakdown of virus clades sequenced per country, but importantly also shows how many different countries have contributed sequences to the database. Within the United States, all states and several territories have contributed SARS-CoV-2 sequences to public databases like GizAid and NCBI, including Wisconsin, where our university and thus our sequencing efforts are located. Breaking down the state of Wisconsin into counties, in this map, the darker the color of the county, the more sequences were generated for confirmed COVID-19 cases in that county per statistics from the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene and the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. These darkest counties also unsurprisingly correspond to regions of denser population. Statewide, there were over 820,000 total confirmed cases as of mid-November 2021 and almost 30,500 total sequences available in GizAid, so approximately 3.7% of the total confirmed cases from the state of Wisconsin have been sequenced. Milwaukee County, in the southeast portion of the state and outlined here with the blue box, contains the city of Milwaukee, which is the most populous city in the state. Milwaukee County had almost 140,000 of the total confirmed cases and about 2,300 total sequences available in GizAid, so approximately 1.7% of the total confirmed cases from the most populous county of Wisconsin have been sequenced. Dane County, in the south central portion of the state, contains the second most populous city in the state, Madison, which is the state capital and the home of our university. Dane County had about 57,500 total confirmed cases and about 4,100 total sequences available in GizAid. So approximately 7.2% of the total confirmed cases from the second most populous area of Wisconsin have been sequenced. Statewide, the two largest contributors of sequences from Wisconsin COVID-19 cases were the CDC and the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. The third largest contributor, with just over 5,800 sequences, was our team at the UW-Madison AIDS Vaccine Research Lab. Throughout the pandemic, there have typically only been two full-time employees at a time within our group focused on the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing efforts since they are just one of the many projects in our overall grant portfolios. But throughout the pandemic, our team has been able to look at some very interesting cases, and I'll present a pair of those here. Madison had the 12th diagnosed SARS-CoV-2 case in the US in early February of 2020, which we sequenced in collaboration with the UW hospitals and clinics and other partners. That 12th case is shown with the red dot marked with the blue arrow in the tree. Overall, that tree shows almost 250 SARS-CoV-2 sequences available for Milwaukee and Dane counties by the end of April of 2020 with the blue and red dots respectively. The purple dots are sequences from elsewhere in Wisconsin 
and the undotted gray lines are subsampled global sequences. A comparison of the sequences showed that the 12th U.S. case did not have any descendant viruses, so transmission was contained. There were multiple subsequent introductions of SARS-CoV-2 to both Dane and Milwaukee counties, with Dane County showing more total introductions, more total branches with red dots, but less extensive community spread than Milwaukee County. In another interesting case, we examined SARS-CoV-2 sequence over time during a persistent infection in an immunocompromised patient. That patient had common variable immunodeficiency and MALT lymphoma and was initially diagnosed with COVID-19 over 300 days ago. A summary of the PCR CT values at various time points is shown here. For those unfamiliar with CT, the important thing to know is that the lower CT number equals more virus particles. So CT10 means more virus than CT30. CT values through repeated testing for this patient never rose above 30. There was unfortunately no sample available for sequencing from the time point of initial COVID-19 diagnosis, but by just over 100 days from the first positive SARS-CoV-2 test, we detected a mutation in the spike gene at amino acid position 484 within the receptor binding motif. This change from wild type glutamic acid to alanine at position 484 had been previously described in other persistently infected immunocompromised patients. This patient started neutralizing antibody therapy around day 200 and subsequent sequencing has shown a globally unique change to threonine at position 484. It is unclear at this time whether that change was caused by the antibody therapy. We have a contract from the CDC to sequence SARS-CoV-2 from cases of immune failure, like breakthrough infection in vaccinated individuals, reinfections, and persistent infections. A major focus will be sequencing from immunocompromised individuals, like the patient in the last case study, as well as developing animal models to study persistent infections to identify future immune escape pathways. Our lab routinely uses macaque models to study various aspects of HIV and Zika virus infections, and recently assisted in improving the Syrian hamster genome with ONT sequencing. Beyond SARS-CoV-2, the phenomena of prolonged infection has also been seen in influenza, so we are beginning to look at viral shedding over time in that context too. But overall, since we will be continuing to sequence SARS-CoV-2 for a while, we are transitioning from the Arctic protocol to the new Midnight protocol to improve throughput and decrease cost. My colleague Rob Maddox will further describe our transition to Midnight. Thanks, Julie. Uh, in the next couple slides, I will give a brief overview of tiled amplicon sequencing used in both the Arctic and Midnight workflows, as well as highlight several key aspects of the Midnight workflow that provide boosts in efficiency and reduce sequencing costs. For the vast majority of our sequencing efforts, our samples are sourced from nasal swab samples that test SARS-CoV-2 positive through qPCR by a local testing provider. Before we receive the samples, they are held and processed for varying amounts of times and temperatures and undergo at least one freeze-thaw cycle, meaning the CT values we record are likely an overestimate of the non-degraded viral genome copies present in the sample by the time we sequence them. We also aim to sequence approximately 192 samples each week for surveillance in the state of Wisconsin, but receive substantially more. In the past couple months, we have sequenced 839 samples, but have received almost 13,000. Our primary goal for sequencing is also to generate consensus sequences for GISAID submission, which requires coverage across 90% of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Each week, we aim to select lower CT samples while maintaining a wide coverage of surveillance across Wisconsin counties to meet this goal. We also occasionally include samples of interest in our sequencing runs, so we are looking to develop strategies within the workflow for one running wide ranges of CT samples in a single flow cell. Both Arctic V3 and Midnight workflows use whole genome tiled primer amplification rather than a whole genome shotgun sequencing approach, which involves creating two pools of primers labeled A and B, 
which uh, that cover the entire SARS-CoV-2 genome. In the Arctic workflow, there are 98 total primer pairs across both pools, which produce 400 base pair amplicons. Neither pool contains any overlapping primers to prevent primer-to-primer -primer interaction during PCR. This tiled amplification is advantageous over shotgun sequencing because it can work with samples with very low viral genome copy numbers, and most of the sequence reads are going to be on target, reducing the amount of sequencing that needs to be done for each sample. After PCR, the A and B pools for each individual sample are combined. As mentioned previously, our sequencing efforts often involve sequencing samples with highly variable CT values, often with samples below a CT of 20 and up to a CT of 30. To make sure that our high CT samples do not get overpowered in the Arctic V3 workflow, we perform an SPRI bead cleanup, qubit, and then normalize all samples before barcoding, excluding samples that fall below our 3 nanogram per microliter threshold. We then perform an end prep reaction, ligate on barcodes, and pool samples into groups of 24. After another SPRI bead cleanup, we ligate on the ONT adapters and load a minion with our 24 sample pools. In this table, I summarize some of the key differences between the midnight and Arctic workflows. One key difference between midnight and Arctic is the number of amplicons that they generate, 98 for Arctic and 29 for midnight. A significant advantage for Midnight's lower number of amplicons is the proportion of the SARS-CoV-2 genome that the primers anneal to. In Arctic, the 98 primer pairs anneal to approximately 17% of the genome, whereas the 29 pairs of Midnight anneal to only about 4%, meaning future mutations in SARS-CoV-2 variants are less likely to fall on a primer binding site for the Midnight primers, which would cause that specific amplicon to drop out of sequencing. Midnight also reduces time and saves on reagent costs by not requiring a normalization step and using the rapid barcoding kit instead of a native barcoding kit. For our purposes, it is also designed to load 96 samples into a single pool, allowing us to sequence 96 samples in one flow cell rather than four. The total time from RT-PCR to starting a sequencing run is only about five and a half hours on midnight, with only about two hours composed of direct hands-on lab work. Finally, the lack of normalization and expansion of 96 samples per flow cell drastically reduces the cost of sequencing per sample down to about $10 per sample with midnight. For the past month, we have been focusing on transitioning from the Arctic V3 workflow to the midnight workflow, which also uses tiled am PCR amplicons, but uses 29 total primer pairs instead of 1,200 base, or of 1,200 base pair amplicons. In addition, the recommendations for midnight suggest loading up to 96 samples into a single flow cell, which allows us to prep our entire sequencing run in a 96 well plate format. Just like in Arctic, after PCR, we combine the A and B amplicons for each sample. A major difference in midnight versus Arctic is the barcoding step. Midnight uses a rapid barcoding kit to attach barcodes to samples, which fragments the 1200 base pair amplicons into many smaller pieces attaching a barcode as it cuts the amplicon. The entire process for setting up and running the barcoding plates for a single 96 sample run takes only about 15 minutes, with just a four minute incubation to facilitate the reaction. Midnight also does not require a normalization step before barcoding, which saves a considerable amount of time and reagents. After barcoding, the workflow is very similar to Arctic in that we pool all the samples, the 96 into a single tube this time, bead cleanup, quantify, attach ONT adapters, and then load onto the sequencer. In the next few slides, I will give a brief overview of some of the data we have generated comparing the midnight and arctic workflows. This chart shows the total mass sites and consensus sequence of each sample at various CT values for our past two midnight runs. Maxed sites are positions that are converted to ends in the consensus due to either poor quality reads or low depth of coverage. The line going across the graph at 3,000 mass sites highlights the threshold for GIS-8 submission, which allows a maximum of 10% mass sites across the entire 30 KB SARS-CoV-2 genome. The red squares represent samples that fall below this 10% benchmark and therefore pass, whereas the blue crosses show samples that do not meet GIS-8 submission uh, standards. As mentioned earlier, the CT values represented here are reported by the testing provider, 
prior to additional sample testing. Therefore, there are likely an overestimate of the non-degraded viral RNA present in the sample at the time of sequencing. In this chart, we are comparing 639 midnight samples to 343 Arctic V3 samples, all with a CT of less than or equal to 25. We arrayed them based on the number of masked bases in each of these approximately 1,000 samples. The green vertical bars here represent dropouts in only Arctic V3, light blue being midnight-only dropouts, and pink being dropouts shared between the two protocols. Among the 25% of samples that have the fewest masked bases, which is the bottom row labeled 75th quantile, we see that in Arctic V3 there are certain amplicons that consistently underperform, causing more frequent dropouts in consensus, including one notably in the spike region, which starts just below nucleotide position 22,000. We do not see, on the other hand, any regions consistently leading to dropouts in the midnight samples. Looking at the 50th quantile, with an intermediate number of masked sites, we see that there is still more masking occurring in Arctic V3 than in midnight. However, there does to be a couple of regions in ORF1A in midnight samples with a high number of masked reads. In the 20th quant 25th quantile, the samples with the highest level of masked bases, we see that once again the masking profile for midnight is a bit more spread out and includes some areas in spike, but still tends to concentrate more in ORF1A, whereas Arctic V3 is distributed throughout many locations across the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Here, we see a simple comparison of what percent of samples with a recorded CT of less than or equal to 25 produce consensus sequences that pass Gizade submission thresholds for the same samples assessed in our previous coverage analysis. As you can see, we found that about two-thirds of our midnight samples were eligible for Gizade submission versus just over half with Arctic. While we are quite happy with the performance of midnight so far, especially the reduced hands-on time, there are some future optimizations we hope to make with the midnight workflow. Ultimately, we cannot change the way we acquire samples, and so we will always be working with potentially degraded samples. In our midnight sequencing, we see consistent dropout in some regions of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, especially in the ORF1A region. Taking a closer look at the primers in this region and optimizing them for our local variant pool may yield better sequencing results and less dropout. Additionally, we are looking into the use of the Benito base caller to improve accuracy. Our regular post-run processing uses guppy base calling, and we have a coverage cutoff of 20 reads to ensure that we are not reporting low quality bases. Higher accuracy base calling could allow us to lower the coverage cutoff, increasing the percent of samples that are eligible for GISAID submission. Bonito base calling is very computationally intensive, however, so we can focus on using Bonito processing only on those samples that fall below GISAID submission threshold after our standard post-guppy post processing. Uh, thanks to everyone involved in our SARS-CoV-2 sequencing efforts, especially the PIs of our team at AVRL, uh, David O'Connor and Tom Friedrich, and former grad students Gage Moreno and Katarina Braun, who implemented SARS-CoV-2 to sequencing in our group. We, re we receive samples through the efforts of quite a few partners from the state of Wisconsin, and this work is funded by the CDC and Fast Grants program.